Hide and Seek by Fyodor Sologub Everything in Lelikov's nursery was bright, pretty, and cheerful. Lelikov's sweet voice charmed her mother. Lelikov was a delightful child. There was no other such child, there never had been, and there never would be. Lelikov's mother, Serafima Alexandrovna, was sure of that. Lelikov's eyes were dark and large, her cheeks were rosy, her lips were made for kisses and for laughter. But it was not these charms in Lelika that gave her mother the keenest joy. Lelika was her mother's only child. That was why every movement of Lelika's bewitched her mother. It was great bliss to hold Lelika on her knees and to fondle her, to feel the little girl in her arms a thing as lively and as bright as a little bird. To tell the truth, Serafima Alexandrovna felt happy only in the nursery. She felt cold with her husband. Perhaps it was because he himself loved the cold he loved to drink cold water, and to breathe cold air. He was always fresh and cool, with a frigid smile, and wherever he passed cold currents seemed to move in the air. The Neslatayevs, Sergei Modestovich and Serafima Alexandrovna, had married without love or calculation, because it was the accepted thing. He was a young man of thirty-five, she a young woman of twenty-five, both were of the same circle and well brought up, he was expected to take a wife and the time had come for her to take a husband. It even seemed to Serafima Alexandrovna that she was in love with her future husband, and this made her happy. He looked handsome and well-bred, his intelligent grey eyes always preserved a dignified expression, and he fulfilled his obligations of a fiancé with irreproachable gentleness. The bride was also good-looking, she was a tall, dark-eyed, dark-haired girl, somewhat timid but very tactful. He was not after her dowry, though it pleased him to know that she had something. He had connections, and his wife came of good, influential people. This might, at the proper opportunity, prove useful. Always irreproachable and tactful, Neslatayev got on in his position not so fast that anyone should envy him, nor yet so slow that he should envy anyone else everything came in the proper measure and at the proper time. After their marriage there was nothing in the manner of Sergei Modestovich to suggest anything wrong to his wife. Later, however, when his wife was about to have a child, Sergei Modestovich established connections elsewhere of a light and temporary nature. Serafima Alexandrovna found this out, and, to her own astonishment, was not particularly hurt, she awaited her infant with a restless anticipation that swallowed every other feeling. A little girl was born, Serafima Alexandrovna gave herself up to her. At the beginning she used to tell her husband, with rapture, of all the joyous details of Lelika's existence. But she soon found that he listened to her without the slightest interest, and only from the habit of politeness. Serafima Alexandrovna drifted farther and farther away from him. She loved her little girl with the ungratified passion that other women, deceived in their husbands, show their chance young lovers. Mamika, let's play Pryatki, hide and seek, cried Lelika, pronouncing the R like the L, so that the word sounded Pliatki. This charming inability to speak always made Serafima Alexandrovna smile with tender rapture. Lelika then ran away stamping with her plump little legs over the carpets, and hid herself behind the curtains near her bed. Tiu Tiu, Mamika, she cried out in her sweet, laughing voice, as she looked out with a single roguish eye. Where is my baby girl, the mother asked, as she looked for Lelika and made believe that she did not see her. And Lelika poured out her rippling laughter in her hiding place. Then she came out a little farther, and her mother, as though she had only just caught sight of her, seized her by her little shoulders and exclaimed joyously, here she is, my Lelika. Lelika laughed long and merrily, her head close to her mother's knees, and all of her cuddled up between her mother's white hands. Her mother's eyes glowed with passionate emotion. Now, Mamika, you hide, said Lelika, as she ceased laughing. Her mother went to hide. Lelika turned away as though not to see, but watched her Mamika stealthily all the time. Mama hid behind the cupboard, and exclaimed, Tiu Tiu, baby girl. Lelika ran round the room and looked into all the corners, making believe, as her mother had done before, that she was seeking though she really knew all the time where her mamika was standing. Where's my mamika? asked Lelika. She's not here, and she's not here, she kept on repeating, as she ran from corner to corner. Her mother stood, with suppressed breathing, her head pressed against the wall, her hair somewhat disarranged. A smile of absolute bliss played on her red lips. The nurse, Fedosha, a good-natured and fine-looking, if somewhat stupid woman, smiled as she looked at her mistress with her characteristic expression, which seemed to say that it was not for her to object to gentlewomen's caprices. She thought to herself, the mother is like a little child herself look how excited she is. 
Lelika was getting near her mother's corner. Her mother was growing more absorbed every moment by her interest in the game, her heart beat with short quick strokes, and she pressed even closer to the wall, disarranging her hair still more. Lelika suddenly glanced toward her mother's corner and screamed with joy. I've found Oo, she cried out loudly and joyously, mispronouncing her words in a way that again made her mother happy. She pulled her mother by her hands to the middle of the room, they were merry and they laughed, and Lelika again hit her head against her mother's knees, and went on lisping and lisping, without end, her sweet little words, so fascinating yet so awkward. Sergi Modestovich was coming at this moment toward the nursery. Through the half-closed doors he heard the laughter, the joyous outcries, the sound of romping. He entered the nursery, smiling his genial cold smile, he was irreproachably dressed, and he looked fresh and erect, and he spread round him an atmosphere of cleanliness, freshness, and coldness. He entered in the midst of the lively game, and he confused them all by his radiant coldness. Even Fedosia felt abashed, now for her mistress, now for herself. Serafima Alexandrovna at once became calm and apparently cold and this mood communicated itself to the little girl, who ceased to laugh, but looked instead, silently and intently, at her father. Sergi Modestovich gave a swift glance round the room. He liked coming here, where everything was beautifully arranged, this was done by Serafima Alexandrovna, who wished to surround her little girl, from her very infancy, only with the loveliest things. Serafima Alexandrovna dressed herself tastefully, this, too, she did for Lelika, with the same end in view. One thing Sergi Modestovich had not become reconciled to, and this was his wife's almost continuous presence in the nursery. It's just as I thought. I knew that I'd find you here, he said with a derisive and condescending smile. They left the nursery together. As he followed his wife through the door Sergi Modestovich said rather indifferently, in an incidental way, laying no stress on his words, don't you think that it would be well for the little girl if she were sometimes without your company? Merely, you see, that the child should feel its own individuality, he explained in answer to Serafima Alexandrovna's puzzled glance. She's still so little, said Serafima Alexandrovna. In any case, this is but my humble opinion. I don't insist. It's your kingdom there. I'll think it over, his wife answered, smiling, as he did, coldly but genially. Then they began to talk of something else. 2. Nurse Fedosia, sitting in the kitchen that evening, was telling the silent housemaid Daria and the talkative old cook Agatha about the young lady of the house, and how the child loved to play Priyatki with her mother she hides her little face, and cries Tiudiu. And the mistress herself is like a little one, added Fedosia, smiling. Agatha listened and shook her head ominously, while her face became grave and reproachful. That the mistress does it, well, that's one thing but that the young lady does it, that's bad. Why? asked Fedosia with curiosity. This expression of curiosity gave her face the look of a wooden, roughly painted doll. Yes, that's bad, repeated Agatha with conviction. Terribly bad. Well, said Fedosia, the ludicrous expression of curiosity on her face becoming more emphatic. She'll hide and hide and hide away, said Agatha, in a mysterious whisper, as she looked cautiously toward the door. What are you saying, exclaimed Fedosia, frightened. It's the truth I'm saying, remember my words, Agatha went on with the same assurance and secrecy. It's the surest sign. The old woman had invented this sign, quite suddenly, herself, and she was evidently very proud of it. 3. Lelika was asleep, and Serafima Alexandrovna was sitting in her own room, thinking with joy and tenderness of Lelika. Lelika was in her thoughts, first a sweet, tiny girl, then a sweet, big girl, then again a delightful little girl, and so until the end she remained Mama's little Lelika. Serafima Alexandrovna did not even notice that Fedosia came up to her and paused before her. Fedosia had a worried, frightened look. Madam, madam, she said quietly, in a trembling voice. Serafima Alexandrovna gave a start. Fedosia's face made her anxious. What is it, Fedosia? she asked with great concern. Is there anything wrong with Lelika? No, madam, said Fedosia, as she gesticulated with her hands to reassure her mistress and to make her sit down. Lelika is asleep, may God be with her. Only I'd like to say something you see Lelika is always hiding herself that's not good. Fedosia looked at her mistress with fixed eyes, which had grown round from fright. Why not good, asked Serafima Alexandrovna, with vexation, succumbing involuntarily to vague fears. I can't tell you how bad it is, said Fedosia, 
and her face expressed the most decided confidence. Please speak in a sensible way, observed Serafima Alexandrovna dryly. I understand nothing of what you are saying. You see, madam, it's a kind of omen, explained Fedosha abruptly, in a shamefaced way. Nonsense, said Serafima Alexandrovna. She did not wish to hear any further as to the sort of omen it was, and what it foreboded. But, somehow, a sense of fear and of sadness crept into her mood, and it was humiliating to feel that an absurd tale should disturb her beloved fancies, and should agitate her so deeply. Of course I know that gentlefolk don't believe in omens, but it's a bad omen, madam, Fedosha went on in a doleful voice, the young lady will hide, and hide. Suddenly she burst into tears, sobbing out loudly, she'll hide and hide and hide away, angelic little soul, in a damp grave, she continued, as she wiped her tears with her apron and blew her nose. Who told you all this? asked Serafima Alexandrovna in an austere low voice. Agafya says so, madam, answered Fedosha, it's she that knows. Knows, exclaimed Serafima Alexandrovna in irritation, as though she wished to protect herself somehow from this sudden anxiety. What nonsense! Please don't come to me with any such notions in the future. Now you may go. Fedosha, dejected, her feelings hurt, left her mistress. What nonsense! As though Lelikov could die, thought Serafima Alexandrovna to herself, trying to conquer the feeling of coldness and fear which took possession, of her at the thought of the possible death of Lelikov. Serafima Alexandrovna, upon reflection, attributed these women's beliefs in omens to ignorance. She saw clearly that there could be no possible connection between a child's quite ordinary diversion and the continuation of the child's life. She made a special effort that evening to occupy her mind with other matters, but her thoughts returned involuntarily to the fact that Lelika loved to hide herself. When Lelika was still quite small, and had learned to distinguish between her mother and her nurse, she sometimes, sitting in her nurse's arms, made a sudden roguish grimace, and hid her laughing face in the nurse's shoulder. Then she would look out with a sly glance. Of late, in those rare moments of the mistress' absence from the nursery, Fedosha had again taught Lelika to hide, and when Lelika's mother, on coming in, saw how lovely the child looked when she was hiding, she herself began to play hide-and-seek with her tiny daughter. 4. The next day Serafima Alexandrovna, absorbed in her joyous cares for Lelika, had forgotten Fedosha's words of the day before. But when she returned to the nursery, after having ordered the dinner, and she heard Lelika suddenly cry to you from under the table, a feeling of fear suddenly took hold of her. Though she reproached herself at once for this unfounded, superstitious dread, Nevertheless she could not enter wholeheartedly into the spirit of Lelika's favorite game, and she tried to divert Lelika's attention to something else. Lelika was a lovely and obedient child. She eagerly complied with her mother's new wishes. But as she had got into the habit of hiding from her mother in some corner, and of crying out to you so even that day she returned more than once to the game. Serafima Alexandrovna tried desperately to amuse Lelika. This was not so easy because restless threatening thoughts obtruded themselves constantly. Why does Lelika keep on recalling the tiu tiu? Why does she not get tired of the same thing of eternally closing her eyes, and of hiding her face? Perhaps, thought Serafima Alexandrovna, she is not as strongly drawn to the world as other children, who are attracted by many things. If this is so, is it not a sign of organic weakness? Is it not a germ of the unconscious non-desire to live? Serafima Alexandrovna was tormented by presentiments. She felt ashamed of herself for ceasing to play hide-and-seek with Lelika before Fedosha. But this game had become agonizing to her, all the more agonizing because she had a real desire to play it, and because something drew her very strongly to hide herself from Lelika and to seek out the hiding child. Serafima Alexandrovna herself began the game once or twice, though she played it with a heavy heart. She suffered as though committing an evil deed with full consciousness. It was a sad day for Serafima Alexandrovna. 5. Lelika was about to fall asleep. No sooner had she climbed into her little bed, protected by a network on all sides, than her eyes began to close from fatigue. Her mother covered her with a blue blanket. Lelika drew her sweet little hands from under the blanket and stretched them out to embrace her mother. Her mother bent down. Lelika, with a tender expression on her sleepy face, kissed her mother and let her head fall on the pillow. As her hands hid themselves under the blanket Lelika whispered, the hands to you the mother's heart seemed to stop Lelika lay there so small, so frail, so quiet. Lelika smiled gently, closed her eyes and said quietly, the eyes to you to you. Then even more quietly, Lelika to you to you. 
With these words she fell asleep, her face pressing the pillow. She seemed so small and so frail under the blanket that covered her. Her mother looked at her with sad eyes. Serafima Alexandrovna remained standing over Lelika's bed a long while, and she kept looking at Lelika with tenderness and fear. I'm a mother, is it possible that I shouldn't be able to protect her, she thought, as she imagined the various ills that might befall Lelika. She prayed long that night, but the prayer did not relieve her sadness. 6. Several days passed. Lelika caught cold. The fever came upon her at night. When Serafima Alexandrovna, awakened by Fedosia, came to Lelika and saw her looking so hot, so restless, and so tormented, she instantly recalled the evil omen, and a hopeless despair took possession of her from the first moments. A doctor was called, and everything was done that is usual on such occasions but the inevitable happened. Serafima Alexandrovna tried to console herself with the hope that Lelika would get well, and would again laugh and play yet this seemed to her an unthinkable happiness. And Lelika grew feebler from hour to hour. All simulated tranquility, so as not to frighten Serafima Alexandrovna, but their masked faces only made her sad. Nothing made her so unhappy as the reiterations of Fedosia, uttered between sobs, she hid herself and hid herself, our Lelika. But the thoughts of Serafima Alexandrovna were confused, and she could not quite grasp what was happening. Fever was consuming Lelika, and there were times when she lost consciousness and spoke in delirium. But when she returned to herself she bore her pain and her fatigue with gentle good nature, she smiled feebly at her mamaka, so that her mamaka should not see how much she suffered. Three days passed, torturing like a nightmare. Lelika grew quite feeble. She did not know that she was dying. She glanced at her mother with her dimmed eyes, and lisped in a scarcely audible, hoarse voice, Tiu Tiu, mamaka. Make Tiu Tiu, mamaka. Serafima Alexandrovna hid her face behind the curtains near Lelika's bed. How tragic! Mamika, called Lelika in an almost inaudible voice. Lelika's mother bent over her, and Lelika, her vision grown still more dim, saw her mother's pale, despairing face for the last time. A white Mamika, whispered Lelika. Mamika's white face became blurred, and everything grew dark before Lelika. She caught the edge of the bed cover feebly with her hands and whispered, Tiu Tiu. Something rattled in her throat, Lelika opened and again closed her rapidly paling lips, and died. Serafima Alexandrovna was in dumb despair as she left Lelika, and went out of the room. She met her husband. Lelika is dead, she said in a quiet, dull voice. Sergi Modestovich looked anxiously at her pale face. He was struck by the strange stupor in her formerly animated handsome features. 7. Lelika was dressed, placed in a little coffin, and carried into the parlor. Serafima Alexandrovna was standing by the coffin and looking dully at her dead child. Sergi Modestovich went to his wife and, consoling her with cold, empty words, tried to draw her away from the coffin. Serafima Alexandrovna smiled. Go away, she said quietly. Lelika is playing. She'll be up in a minute. Saima, my dear, don't agitate yourself, said Sergi Modestovich in a whisper. You must resign yourself to your fate. She'll be up in a minute, persisted Serafima Alexandrovna, her eyes fixed on the dead little girl. Sergi Modestovich looked round him cautiously, he was afraid of the unseemly and of the ridiculous. Saima, don't agitate yourself, he repeated. This would be a miracle, and miracles do not happen in the 19th century. No sooner had he said these words than Sergi Modestovich felt their irrelevance to what had happened. He was confused and annoyed. He took his wife by the arm and cautiously led her away from the coffin. She did not oppose him. Her face seemed tranquil and her eyes were dry. She went into the nursery and began to walk round the room, looking into those places where Lelika used to hide herself. She walked all about the room, and bent now and then to look under the table or under the bed, and kept on repeating cheerfully, Where is my little one? Where is my Lelika? After she had walked round the room once she began to make her quest anew. Fedosia, motionless, with dejected face, sat in a corner, and looked frightened at her mistress, then she suddenly burst out sobbing, and she wailed loudly. She hid herself, and hid herself, our Lelika, our angelic little soul. Serafima Alexandrovna trembled, paused, cast a perplexed look at Fedosia, began to weep, and left the nursery quietly. 8. Sergi Modestovich hurried the funeral. He saw that Serafima Alexandrovna was terribly shocked by her sudden misfortune, and as he feared for her reason he thought she would more readily be diverted and consoled when Lelika was buried. 
Next morning Serafima Alexandrovna dressed with particular care for Lelika. When she entered the parlor there were several people between her and Lelika. The priest and deacon paced up and down the room, clouds of blue smoke drifted in the air, and there was a smell of incense. There was an oppressive feeling of heaviness in Serafima Alexandrovna's head as she approached Lelika. Lelika lay there still and pale, and smiled pathetically. Serafima Alexandrovna laid her cheek upon the edge of Lelika's coffin, and whispered, Tiu Tiu, little one. The little one did not reply. Then there was some kind of stir and confusion around Serafima Alexandrovna, strange, unnecessary faces bent over her, someone held her and Lelika was carried away somewhere. Serafima Alexandrovna stood up erect, sighed in a lost way, smiled, and called loudly, Lelika. Lelika was being carried out. The mother threw herself after the coffin with despairing sobs, but she was held back. She sprang behind the door, through which Lelika had passed, sat down there on the floor, and as she looked through the crevice, she cried out, Lelika, Tiu Tiu. Then she put her head out from behind the door, and began to laugh. Lelika was quickly carried away from her mother, and those who carried her seemed to run rather than to walk, 